It's a Christmas miracle. I'm not disabled anymore. Really, really. Administrative law judge Stephanie Kaddish said so. Check it out. This was her decision based on the application for a period of disability and disability insurance benefits protectively filed on March 11th, 2020. The claimant is not disabled under sections 216I and 223D of the Social Security Act. You know what else is a Christmas miracle? She signed it, this is signed November 26th, 2021. Even on the front it says November 26th, 2021. But it was postmarked November 20th, 2021. And I received it on November 26th, 2021. Can you believe that? Well, I might have gotten it Saturday, just November 27th. I don't remember when I got it. But I'm pretty sure I remember getting it. I remember getting it either Black Friday or Shop Small Saturday because I was out and about doing my my thing with... Um, hey, cheers. I was doing my Krampuschnacht video um, up in at Powell Mountain in West Virginia. That's what I was doing. And I came home. And I get this package saying, I'm not disabled anymore. It's just so incredible. I thought I was disabled. I have a parking placard saying I'm disabled, so I can park in, dis in the handicapped parking. I have a difficult time climbing up the steps of my house. I can't be on my feet for more than a few minutes. I feel like the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz because all of my my joints and my muscles are just constantly stiff and creaky and painful and I have this brain fog that I can't seem to shake not that I was all that sharp before chemo but I definitely have it, it's definitely gotten worse since I went through chemotherapy you're a mean one madam judge I'm gonna write a whole song about her watch me this is how it works you file for disability and everybody knows how the game is played. You are disabled. You cannot work physically, mentally, whatever is wrong. You cannot commit to an employer to be at a specific place at a specific time for a specific duration long enough to achieve substantial gain. What's it called? Substantial gainful activity. So you file for disability because, now there's two kinds of disability. There's SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income. That's for people who are poor. It, it's income-based. I tried to, you have to apply for SSI before you can apply for SSDI. So I applied for SSI and they denied me on the spot because my husband living off of his retirement from the military and keep in mind he was enlisted he was not an officer his retirement from the military was fourteen hundred dollars a month and that precluded me from getting ssi benefits fourteen hundred dollars a month for two people you tell me where in the world well where in the united states two people can live sufficiently substantial gainful living for $1,400 a month. I would really like to know where, where you could do that. I got denied my SSI, so I applied for SSDI, which is Social Security Disability Insurance. And this is what you pay into. When you see on your paycheck stub, you see the words FICA, part of that money goes for your disability insurance. You have to have 20 of the last 40 quarters. You have to pay into FICA. Well, when you're self-employed, forget it. You don't, you don't have that. I don't understand all of this, which is part of the problem. Let me give you some background about my disability journey. I have had foot problems since I was 14 years old. And as I think about it, I think my problems probably started 
I was probably born with certain things because like I was never able to do cartwheels when I was a kid. I was never able to do that thing. You know those bars that are like parallel bars and kids spin around and around. They, they swing by their, their knees and they swing around and around like that. I, I was never able to do that. So I think my proprioception disorder probably started when I was a kid, I just didn't have a name for it. We didn't know what it was and I wasn't, I was never diagnosed with it. But proprioception disorder is when you, you don't have a good sense of the, of your surroundings. You get dizzy. I didn't get dizzy. I just couldn't, I couldn't balance. I couldn't put my feet over my head. I was never able to dive like in swimming. Everybody can dive off the diving board. I was never able to do that, never. I would just do belly flops. So I was never able to put my feet over my head. So I think that's where my proprioception disorder started, probably. And then when I was 14, I started having really bad foot problems. So my, or foot pain, I should say. And my mom took me to the podiatrist, I got, um, those $800 orthotics, custom made orthotics for my shoes. I don't think they were $800 back then, but I have definitely paid $800 for professionally made orthotics from a podiatrist. Um, and it cracks me up when people say, oh, you should just go get the Dr. Scholl stuff or go to Fleet Feet. They have inserts. You should try them. Okay, give me a break. I have been dealing with this since I was 14. I am now 51 and I know what's going on and what what works for the rest of society does not work for me. I am a special case, but bless your heart for, for, for trying. Funny, going off tangent here, bless your heart in Kentucky means a totally different thing than bless your heart. In Nevada when I was 35 my feet just decided they didn't want to work anymore I couldn't wear regular shoes I couldn't walk I couldn't stand I actually put myself in a wheelchair because I couldn't move I was actually crawling around the floors of my house on my hands and knees because I couldn't stand and I really had problems just getting to work like parking my car would park I'd have to park my car here go in to the the front of the door and then walk all the way over to my cubicle like say here's the door and my cubicles way over here and then have to get to the bathroom and then come back to my cubicle and then the cafeteria like said my cu cubicles over here front doors over here the cafeteria was way over here so I had trouble walking all of that distance. So I just got a, a cheap wheelchair and started using that at work. And my coworkers are like, give me a break, Gwen. Really, you're that big of a drama queen? No, I'm not that big of a drama queen. I'm having serious pain here. So I went, I went from podiatrist to podiatrist trying to find a solution. Found a podiatrist in Sacramento who said she could surgically correct my feet. So I got the left foot done with the expectation of getting the right foot done after the left foot healed. Well, that never happened because the left foot never healed correctly. So what she did was she took a, she removed a joint out of my first metatarsal and, and then sliced my heel and moved it and stuck a bolt in my heel to create an arch because I'm severely flat footed and I have hypermobility in my feet. So my feet, a normal person, a normal person's feet walk like this and my feet walk like this. So I have a lot of nerve damage in my feet because I'm not walking consistently and properly. So she created an arch and some stability so that my feet wouldn't be so mobile. And then she stretched my Achilles tendon. 
and that was supposed to work and then I was supposed to get the left the right foot done eventually the surgery happened and that and, and I was supposed to get the right foot done first it was gonna be a month later and then it was six months later and then it was a year later and finally it's like you know what this just this isn't working this is not a good thing at all so um, I never got the right foot done because the left foot never never healed correctly so in the meantime now I've got two different shaped feet and then as it goes up you've got your foot problems and they go up into the knee years later and then up into the hips and now it's up into my back when you're in so much pain from your feet you can't move as much you 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 can't you're not as active so you're not burning as many calories so you start gaining weight and then you add that weight onto your already bad feet, your already bad knees, your already bad hips, your already bad back, and you just keep gaining weight. And it's harder and harder to lose weight because you're having more and more mobility issues. You're, you're less mobile because you're, you, your body just doesn't move like it used to. You're in so much pain that it, it's hard to be, mobile. If you don't think this takes a toll on your psyche, you're fooling yourself. So that was me before cancer. So I'm going into my cancer journey with the added weight gain, the foot problems, the proprioception disorder. I had all of that, those three things, before I got cancer. I will never forget on December 11th, 2017, I was taking a shower and I felt a pea-sized lump in my right breast. And I just dismissed it because my sister, who was 12 years older than me, had a lump in her right breast, same one o'clock position as mine, and it turned out to be a benign cyst. I was in the process of getting my new job at the Greater Fort Wayne Business Weekly in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I, I was just gonna wait until my insurance benefits kicked in and then I was gonna get a mammogram. I started my new job January 3rd, 2018. My health insurance benefits were gonna kick in April 1st and I was just gonna wait until then to get a mammogram. In February, this little pea-sized, uh, marble is what it felt like it just felt like a marble morphed and it turned into some sort of mass it, it didn't really have a, a, a shape to it and it just kept getting bigger and the skin kept getting darker and then finally I got this little pink a, a different shade of pink a lighter shade of pink on my areola and I'm like oh shit this is so so not good. I was still in denial, even in, I knew that my benefits came up April 1st, but I was still getting used to my new job and I just wanted to, be, I wanted to be good at my new job. I just really wanted to put all of my energy into this new job of mine. And finally my sister-in-law said, Gwen, you have to get this checked out. On Monday, April 9th, 2018, I finally called the advice nurse and told her my story and she said, oh honey, we got to get you into urgent care. So I went to urgent care, talked to the, the uh, nurse practitioner there and she said, I'm going to send you over to the cancer center and they're going to they're gonna deal with you there. So then I go to the cancer center. They couldn't get me in for a mammogram that day, but they could do a punch biopsy there in the office. And I am telling you, a punch biopsy in your nipple is more painful than childbirth. I'm not kidding you. Whenever I go to a doctor's office and they wanna know what your pain level is, my 10 used to be childbirth, my 10 is now getting a punch biopsy in your nipple. It's painful. 
So I got this punch biopsy, and later that night, it was 9.08 at night, I remember, the doctor calls me up, and she says, Gwen, I have, it's HER2 positive invasive ductal carcinoma. It's stage two breast cancer. So thank God, thank God we got it caught as soon as we did. My first day of chemo was, I think it was May 5th. It was May, the first week of May. I think it was May 5th. So I have chemo um, and, and it's, so HER2 positive invasive ductal carcinoma is an extremely aggressive form of cancer. It's highly metastatic and it will spread quickly. So the, the plan was to do what's called Red, De Red Devil. They actually have a name for it. Um, it. It's Adrian Myosin. I did, what was it? I think eight weeks, I could be wrong, but I think it was eight weeks of Adrian Myosin or maybe six, 16 weeks. I don't remember what it was, but I did Adrian Myosin and then I did Taxol for a few weeks after that. And then I had to do um, Progetta and something else, I forgot. I forgot what all I had, but I had to do this whole wave of chemotherapy, and then I had my right breast removed, and then I had six weeks of radiation, which I'm gonna tell you right now, radiation is worse than chemotherapy. It is horrible. So all during this time, I'm working full time. I have, I have my chemo set on Thursdays because the way my chemo worked was I got sick. I still got sick off of chemo, but I would get sick on Sunday. So four days later, so I could work Monday through Friday and be super tired on Saturday and then sick on Sunday. And then I'd go back to work on Monday and I'd be fine. And on Thursdays when I would be doing my infusions, I could, I just used the infusion center as a co-working space and I could set up my laptop and my phone and if I needed to do any phone interviews, any writing, any research, I could do all of that right there in the cancer center. So that was really cool, that was handy. But during that time, we had, the, the newspaper I was working for had this changeover in management and the, 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 the previous publisher just said, Gwen, I want you to get a 20 page newspaper out every week. I don't care what you have to do. I don't care how many hours you work. Just get that 20 page newspaper out. And I was able to do that. Well, this new management company comes in. The, the old publisher gets, he stepped down. And this new management team came over and boy, did they have a lot of changes. They just wanted all of these changes. And I was not well enough to keep up with all of these changes that they wanted. And finally, the last day of radiation, I get an email saying, Gwen, we have zero advertising. So I had to come up with, so normally with the newspaper, you have 70% advertising and 30% content. Well, we never, ever, ever had 70%. I was lucky if I could get 40%. And most of the time it was between eight and 16%. So finally, here it is. I am the, at the weakest point physically I have been in during my entire cancer journey and I have zero ads, which means I have to come up with 20 pages of content that day. There was just no way, no how that was gonna happen. So I, it was December 28th, 2018, and I, I had to call up the, publish, the, the new CEO and say, I am so sorry, but I can't, I can't come up with 20 pages of, of cop content in one day. And I was down a reporter, I was down two reporters. When I started this job, I had three reporters on my staff. We laid off one and then another reporter was on disability or on, on short-term disability. 
So uh, we had a freelancer that we were using to replace the one, uh, the one who was on medical leave, but we still didn't have someone to replace, to, to, to pick up for the, the one that we lost. And I was too sick to, to pick up the pieces there. So I just quit. So then I spend a year trying to make it as an independently published author. I'm just gonna finish my novel. I am going to hustle it as an independent author. And I'm just finding out that in order to be a successful independent author, you have to hustle. An independent author not only has to craft the book, but you have to market it, you have, you have to design it, you have to you have to hustle anyone who is self-employed has to hustle it was just it was too much it was just too much and i wasn't well enough someone i can't remember who it was but someone finally convinces me to file for disability on march 11th 2020 i filed for disability now the way the game works is first you have to apply for supplemental security income. This is SSI. And this is income based. I was not generating any income of my own, but Eddie, he got $1,400 a month from the military in retirement and $600 a month from the VA for disability. Now I realize that is above the poverty level, but the poverty level is too low as it is. And people shouldn't have to, people shouldn't have to live like that. The poverty level is too damn low, and it's disgusting. It's horrible. It is absolutely horrible. I finally file for Social Security Disability Insurance. This is the insurance that you pay as an employee when you see FICA on your paycheck that money goes towards social security. So that's for when you, social security, once you turn 65 or 62 and a half, I don't, I don't know how old, how old you have to be to get social security, but it also goes into your social security disability insurance. You have to put in so much in order to qualify for it. So I've been, I have been working since I was 17 with the exception of the time that I was on Unemployment, which has happened recently. The newspaper I was working for sold, and so I lost my job. I filed for unemployment. So I was unemployed for most of 2017 to, to hustle my own copywriting business and as a freelance journalist. That didn't bring in enough money. You really have to hustle, and it takes a long time to build up your business if you're gonna be self-employed it takes a long time to build up your business you can't just do it your first three years you're usually going to be taking a cut i didn't make much money in 2017 at all 2018 we moved to fort wayne i'm working as the editor of the greater fort wayne business weekly and then i get cancer i filed for ssdi march 11th 2020 as part of that process, I had to get a medical examination and a mental examination. Now keep in mind, this is in 2020. This was before the depression had set in and this was before every, everything has, has compounded since March of 2020. So I, I passed my mental exam with flying colors. So. I, I didn't qualify for disability based on my mental exam at that time. The physical doctor who examined me brought up the proprioception disorder and said I was a fall risk. And so she was going to recommend, she told me at least, that she was going to recommend that I, that my claim be approved because I was a fall risk for an employer. My initial application was denied. And we all know that's the game. The game goes like this. You make an initial application, it gets denied. Then you file 
for reconsideration, which most people call an appeal. But it's con it, the technical term is reconsideration. You file for reconsideration and that gets denied. And then you file for a hearing with an administrative law judge. And that's usually where you win your case and you get all of your back pay. My case was denied. My hearing was October 4th, 2021. She waits until Black Friday to send me her decision saying that she has denied my claim. And she denied my claim because I passed my mental health exam with flying colors and because I can do sedentary work. No, I told her during the hearing and we had the vocational expert there and everything. She was asking the vocational expert about um, what kind of work can be done in the local economy for, for someone who can't stand who has to be sedentary. And the vocational expert came up with some different things like, I don't know, watching cameras at Walmart or whatever. And I told her, I, I spoke up afterward and I said, the problem is it, it isn't just about being sedentary. Even if I'm sedentary, I have to get up because I'm at that age, I'm 51 years old, I have to pee a lot. So I'm constantly having to get up to go pee. It is difficult for me to stand up after being sedentary for a while. And then I have to walk to the bathroom and pray I don't lose control of my bladder and then walk back. And then I'm in chronic pain, so I don't know if I'm gonna have a good day or a bad day. I can't commit to an employer to be at a certain place at a certain time for 40 hours a week. I can't do that. I have too much chronic pain, I have chronic fatigue syndrome, and I have brain fog. The, the judge just dismissed all of that. And keep in mind that thanks to the coronavirus, I didn't have an in-person hearing. Everything was done on the phone. I went to my attorney's office. I had to sit in one office, one little office, by myself. The attorney had to be away from me. The judge can't even see me. She's on the phone in Indianapolis or Fort Wayne or whatever. And then they, there's a vocational expert. She, she completely disregarded my comment about the chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and brain fog. And she dismissed the brain fog because I had passed my mental exam a year and a half ago with flying colors. Well, as the, the disability continues and problems compound, it really takes a toll on your psyche. And I'm looking my, at myself, I'm looking at how, how hard it is for me just to get through daily life. I'm not the wife that I used to be. I've gained a lot of weight. I've lost a breast. I, I, I don't cook and clean like I used to. I can't be as active on our adventures as I used to be. And Eddie, who himself is a disabled veteran, has more responsibility for household chores and for generating income. And I'm relying on him. It, it's a lot of stress on a 58 year old disabled veteran I, I went to see a therapist. The only one, there was only one therapist in all of Fort Wayne who would take my insurance. At the, at the time, I was on Tricare, but even out of pocket, it was seventy-five dollars a session. Seventy-five dollars a session is a lot of money, and I'm pouring my heart out to this woman, and all she wants to do is give me some uh, coping mechanisms like breathing and counting. And I'm just like, you know, this is bullshit. I have real world problems that are causing real world negative effects on my psyche and breathing and counting doesn't do shit. It doesn't solve the problem. I need to have a solution. I need to be able to have a plan to have a solution. When my hands are tied and I can't do anything to improve my situation, 
that's when I really start, that's when the depression hits. I start feeling like, oh my God, I am this worthless hack, a burden to, to my husband. If I didn't have, Sabrina would be, tra if anything happened to me, my daughter would be traumatized big time. So she's my reason for staying alive. And as much as I know my husband loves me and I love Eddie and we, we have a good marriage. We have a solid marriage. But in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking, well, maybe he'd be happier if he could find someone who was more active and could keep up with him on all of these outdoor adventures that he wants to do and who who was thinner and more beautiful and had two boobs and he'd, he'd just be better off if he could find someone better than me and then i start thinking oh my god what if he's alone all of his life what if he doesn't find anyone what if he has to settle for less how many times have you know i have known people personally who have been married for a long time and then widowed for a long time and then they get remarried and that second marriage is a disaster oh my god i don't want eddie to go through that so i have to stay alive i have to stay alive for eddie i have to stay alive for sabrina so as long as i'm staying alive i might as well continue making these videos i might as well continue writing books but in order to succeed as a youtuber i need money to build my studio, get professional equipment. Right now I'm just recording off of my iPhone. Um, and as you can see, this is my studio. It's the front room of this uh, apart, this duplex that we're renting. As an independent author, I need to be able to pay for uh, editors and uh, cover artists and all of the, and I just spent $165 um, applying for a book awards because I'm I'm hoping that Zinfandel's Grimoire will um, win some awards because you have to be an award-winning writer to get anywhere you need those awards and those awards cost money to enter and you have to have a cover designer you have to have a professional editor and it costs money to even if you do the KDP select it still costs money it costs even more if you want to do the other options available for independent publishers. So it's expensive. It's very expensive. And then you need to be able to have the physical stamina to hustle. And that's true for any self-employed person, any kind of entrepreneur. You have to be able to hustle. That takes time. That takes physical energy. It takes mental concentration. And those are my struggles right now. I have a two-prong solution to my problems. The first, of course, is legislation. The Social Security Act needs to be amended, and it needs to be amended in favor of people who are disabled. And we need our legislators, and we need our executive branch, that means Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, I'm going to play nice with everybody in the political arena. And I'm going to ask you to please consider amending the Social Security Act so that it benefits people with disabilities. Because right now, you cannot live off of, if, if I, even if I did get my claim approved, I would only get $1,236 a month. If I were single, that is not enough money to live off of. I do not, I have friends who are single, who are, who are on SSDI. That is not enough money to live on. It isn't. And they usually end up getting roommates or they really have to, it's an unfair existence because nobody asks to be disabled. I didn't bring this on myself. It totally happened outside of my control. I am not lazy. I am not just trying to get attention. It's a serious problem. And for some reason, we have an economic system and I'm going to save the whole Marxism versus Smith, Adam Smith's invisible hand discussion 
for another video because I'm telling you right now, the invisible hand has been amputated. I am not a Marxist. I think I, I have read the Communist Manifesto. I think it's an antiquated document and it's not going to work. It's not going to work in the real world. But we need to have a safety net for the most vulnerable population. If you would like to support me on Patreon, please visit patreon.com slash rivervine. I also have a freelance journalism and copywriting business. You can go to gwenclaytonwrites.com for more information. If you have a business and need someone to write your about section of your website or your Facebook page or your LinkedIn page or whatever, or if you need content developed or blogs written or any other written materials, I can help you with that. Please PM me for more information. If you like paranormal fiction, my books can be found on Amazon and all, the, all of the links will be in the description below.